The Inner Way, Part 2 Sermon 4 One of the three grades of those who learn here to die to themselves in nature and spirit, that they may, like the grain of wheat, bring forth much fruit, that is, of those who are beginning, of those who are advancing, and of those who are perfect. Unless the grain of wheat, falling into the ground, dieth, itself remaineth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. By the wheat we understand our Lord Jesus Christ, who by his death was brought forth much fruit for all men, if they are but willing, not only to reign with him, but also and, in the first place, desire to follow him in a dying life. For this may be called a dying life, when a man for the love of God refuses to gratify his senses, and take his natural pleasure, and follow his own will. And as many lusts as he dies to, so many deaths does he offer to God and so many fruits of life will he receive in return. For in what measure a man dies to himself, and grows out of himself, in the same measure does God, who is our life, enter into him. Now mark, dear children, that the path of a man thus dying may be divided into three stages. Those who have entered on the lowest stage do acts of self-denial from fear of hell and for the hope of heaven, with some love to God mingled therewith, which leads them to shun the most flagrant sins. But the love of God seldom works strongly in them, except to be stirred up by the contemplation of hell or heaven, for by reason of their blind self-love these men are terribly afraid of death, and are by no means eager to set their hand to the work of mortifying their undisciplined nature, which shrinks therefrom. And they have little faith, which is the cause of this timorous weakness, that leads them to be ever fearing for their own safety. Thus, just as formerly they sought and loved themselves in all kinds of carnal enjoyments and worldly vanities, and avoided bodily pain and inconvenience out of self-love, so now is the same motive at work, leading them to shun sin on account of punishment, in order to escape hell and obtain the rewards of heaven. And when they are still young in the love of God, they are apt to taste little sweetness in loving God, and save when they hope to enjoy something from his love, as, for instance, to escape hell and get to heaven. And if sometimes they meditate on the sufferings of our Lord and weep over them with strong emotion, it is because they think how he was willing to suffer so much for their sakes, and to redeem them by his bitter death. Still, because their love is small, they are much more inclined to dwell upon the bodily sufferings that he endured in his human nature, than to reflect how he manifested his death the highest perfection of all virtue, as humility, love, and patience, and therein so greatly glorified his heavenly Father. For this sort of person set out and begin to die, as while as yet they love themselves far too well, hence they are not able to see truly what it is to resign themselves to God and to maintain a spirit of submission. And, although God does all things for the best, yet this they will never believe, and it is a perpetual stumbling block to them. Thus they ask, often, and wonder, 
why our Lord chose to suffer so much, and why he leads his friends and followers to himself along such a path of suffering. When they are at the beginning of a dying life, and only halfway inclined toward true perfection, nor perceive as yet wherein this consists, they oftentimes torment themselves while watching and fasting in an austere way of life. For whatever is outwardly painful to the flesh, they fancy to be greatly and mightily regarded and prized by God. So, when they eagerly take upon themselves all the hardships they can, when they think they have reached the summit of perfection and judge all other men, nay, even those who are much more perfect than themselves, and think meanly of all who do not practice outward austerities, calling them low-minded and ignorant in spiritual things, and those who do not feel as they do do, they think to have gone astray altogether from a spiritual course and desire that all men should be as they are, and whatever methods of avoiding sin they have practiced and still make use of by reason of their infirmity, they desire, nay, demand, that every one else should observe, and, if any do not do so, they judge them and murmur at them, and say that they pay no regard to religion. Now while they keep themselves and all that belongs to them as it were working in their own service, and in this self-love, unduly regard themselves as their own property, they cut themselves off from the Lord and from the universal charity. For they ought to cherish continually a general love towards all men, both good and bad. But they remain absorbed in their partial and separate affections, whereby they bring upon themselves much disquiet, and remain a prey to their besetting sin of always seeking and studying themselves. And they are very niggardly in their spiritual blessings towards their fellow Christians, for they devote all their prayers and religious exercises to their own behalf. And if they pray and do not have any other kind act for others, they think it is a great thing, and fancy they have done them a great service thereby. In short, as they look little within, and are so little enlightened in the knowledge of themselves, so also they make little increase in the love of God and their neighbor. For they are so entangled with unregulated affections that they live alone in heart, not thoroughly commingled, commingling their soul with any in the right sort of thorough love. For the love of God, which ought to unite them to men, to God and all mankind is wanting in them, and although they appear to keep the ordinances of God and of Holy Church, they do not keep the law of love. What they do is more out of constraint and fear than from hearty love, and because they are inwardly unfaithful to God, they dare not trust Him. For the imperfection which they find in themselves makes a flaw in their love to God. Hence, their whole life is full of care, full of toil and ignoble misery. For they see eternal life on the one side and fear to lose it, and they see hell on the other and the fear to fall into it. And all their prayers and religious exercises cannot chase away their fear of hell, so long as they do not die unto themselves. For the more they love themselves, and take counsel for their own welfare, the more the fear of hell grows upon them, insomuch that, when God does not help them forward as much as they wish, they complain, and they weep and sigh at every little difficulty they encounter, however small, such as being tempted to vanity 
wandering thoughts, and the like. They make long stories of what is of no consequence, and talk about their great difficulties and sufferings, as if they were grievously wronged. For they esteem their works, although small, to be highly meritorious, and that God Almighty owes them great honor and blessings in return. But our Lord will tell them, as he does in fact afterwards, when he has enlightened them with his grace, a poor fool loves his own wooden stick, or any other little worthless article, as much as a rich and wise man loves his sword, or any other great and precious thing. All such are standing on the lowest steps of a mortified life, and, if they do not die to themselves more, and come to experience more of what a mortified life is, it is to be feared that they will fall back from what little whereunto they have attained, and may plunge into the depths of folly and wickedness, from which God keep us all. But before a man comes to such a fall, God gives him great spiritual delight, and upon this he is so greatly rejoiced that he cheerfully enjoy, endures all sort of austerities and penances, and then he weepeth that he hath arrived at perfection, and begins to judge his neighbors, and wants to shape all men after his own model so greatly does he esteem himself in his own conceits. Then God comes in his mercy to teach him what he is, and to show him what error he has fallen, and permits the enemy to set before him and make him taste the sweetness of sin. And then, when he has thus tasted, he conceives an inclination to one sin after another, and he cannot rid himself of these inclinations. Then he wishes to flee sin that he may escape hell, and begins to do outward good works, and yet it is a dreadful toil to perform these good works as a mere labor, and to put himself into pain. Thus he is brought into an agonizing struggle with himself, and does not know which way to turn, for he dimly sees that he is gone astray. Then must God of his mercy come to raise him up, and he shall cry earnestly to God for help. And his chief meditation shall be on the life and works, especially the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second degree in which the grain of wheat dies, is when a man is called upon to endure insult, contempt, and such like deaths, and, so long as his grace lasts, he would fain continue to suffer, for by the sense of undeserved injury or all his powers are but quickened and raised into a higher state of activity, but when he is bereft of his gracious sense of the divine presence, for as much as he is still far from perfection, he cannot bear up under this spiritual destitution, and, through his infirmity, falls a prey to mistrust of God, and fancies that God has forsaken him, and is not willing to help him towards perfection. Often he is in a hundred minds what to do or not do, and, if our Lord show him some kindness, then he feels as if all were well between soul and God, and he feels himself so rich, as if he could never be more poor, and thinks to enjoy the presence and savor of God, though as yet he is quite untried. Just as if the Almighty were his own personal, special friend, and he is ready to believe that our Lord is, so to speak, at his disposal, will comfort him in adversity, 
and enrich him with all virtues. But, forasmuch as our gracious Lord sees that such a man will be very apt to rely upon his imagined powers, and thus fall grievously, and sees also that the best and ripest fruit is being lost, inasmuch as the man has yet attained to that perfection to which our Lord desires to lead him. Therefore in due time he withdraws from him all that he had revealed to him, because the man was too much occupied with himself, with thinking about his own perfection, wisdom, holiness, and virtues. He thus brings him through poverty to dissatisfaction with himself, and a humble acknowledgment that he is just that he has neither wisdom nor worthiness. Then does he begin to reflect within himself how justly Almighty God has stayed his hand from bestowing any sensible tokens of his mercy, because he fancied that he was something. Now he sees clearly that he is nothing. He was wont to care for his good name and honor in the world, and to defend them as a man stands up for his wedded wife, and to count them who spoke evil of him as enemies to the common good. He was wont to desire and thirst after the reputation of holiness, like a meadow after the dew of heaven. He weaned that men's praises of him, and proceeded altogether from real goodness and sympathy of heart, and by God's ordination, and had wandered so far from the self-knowledge as not to see that he was in himself unsound from head to foot. He fancied that he was really, as he stood in man's opinion, and knew nothing to the contrary. Here we must mark that he who wishes to heal himself of such like grievous mistakes, and subdue such an unmortified nature, must take note of three points in himself. First, how much he has striven to endure cheerfully, for the sake of goodness, all the rebuke, slander, and shame that has come upon him, patiently and enduring in its heart, without outward complaint. Secondly, how much in the time of his rebuke, shame and distress he was praised and glorified God in his fellow men, and shown kindness to his neighbor in all his ways, in spite of all contradiction against himself. Thirdly, let him examine himself whether he have loved with cheerful and willing heart the men or creatures who have thus persecuted him, and sincerely prayed for them, and, if he finds that he has not done so, and is willing, unwilling to do so, but is hard and bitter in his grief, then he may surely know, and ought to feel certain, that there is something false in him, and some resting in the praise of men, and in his own spiritual pride, and that he is not dead. He is yet come to the second step of a dying life. But our kind Lord, like a tender mother who is full of love, or a wise physician who desires to restore a sick man to perfect health by his powerful remedies, suffers him to fall many times that he may learn to know himself, and thus he falls into fleshly unspiritual temptations, such as he never experienced in those past days, in which he fancied himself very good and spiritual-minded. Our, our of mercy, God deprives him of all understanding, and overclouds all the light in which he walked aforetime, and so hedges him in with thorns of an anguished conscience, that he thinks nothing else but that he is cast off from the light of God's countenance, and he moans greatly, and often with many tears exclaims, O oh my God, 
Why hast thou cast me off? And why go I thus mourning all the days of my pilgrimage? And when he finds himself thus, from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, unlike God and at variance with him, he is filled with a sense of his own unworthiness, and with displeasure at himself, insomuch that he can hardly abide himself. And then he thinks many miserable things about himself from passages of Holy Scripture, and sheds many tears in the sense of his sinfulness, till he is weighed down to the earth with the pressure of God's hand, and exclaims with the prophet, My sins are more in number than the sands of the sea. They have taken hold upon me, that I am not able to look up. For I have stirred up God's anger against me, and done much evil in his sight. These things he saith, and more the like. And at times he is not even able thus to weep and lament. And then he is still more tormented with tribulation and assaults. For on the one hand he feels a strong desire to cast himself down humbly and die to himself, and on the other he is conscious of a great pride and arrogance about himself till he is so exasperated at himself, but for the honor of God he would fain kill himself. I believe that all such conflict greatly wears out the intellectual and natural powers, for it is so excessive that one would rather suffer oneself to be put to death than endure it. Yet one grace is left him, namely that he looks on it all as of no moment. Whatever may be poured out over him, if only he may not knowingly offend God. After a while the grace of tears come back to him, and he cried to God and says, O Lord, rise, why sleepest thou? and asks him why he hath sealed up the fountains of his mercy. He calls upon the holy angels and blessed spirits to have pity on him. He asks the heavens why they have become as brass, and the earth wherefore she is as iron, and beseeches the very stones to have compassion on his woes. He exclaims, Am I become as the blasted hill of Gilboa, which was cursed of David that no rain or dew should fall on it? And how should my wickedness alone vanquish the invisible God, and force him to shut up his mercies, whose property it is to have mercy and to help? In the second stage of the dying life, God leads the soul through these exercises and operations of his hand, as through fire and water by turns, until the workings of self-sufficiency are driven out from all the secret corners of the spirit, and the man henceforward is so utterly ashamed of himself, and so casts himself off, that he can never more ascribe any greatness to himself but thorough, thoroughly perceives all his own weakness, in which he now is and always has been, and whatever he does or desires to do, or whatever good thing may be said of him, he does not take it to his own credit, for he knows not how to say anything of himself but that he is full of all manner of infirmity. Then he has reached the end of this stage, and he who has arrived at this point is not far from the threshold of great mercies, by which he shall enter into the bride-chamber of Christ. Then, when the day of his death has come, he shall be brought in by the bridegroom with great rejoicing. It is hard to die. We know that little trees do not strike their roots deep into the earth, 
and therefore they cannot stand long. So it is with all humble hearts, who do not take deep root in earth, but in heaven. But the great trees which have waxed high, and are intended to endure long upon the earth, and these strike their roots deep, and spread them out wide into the soil, so it is with the men who in old times, and now at the present, have been great upon earth. They must needs, through many a struggle and death, die unto themselves. Therefore all the self-sufficiency of their hearts can be broken down, and they can be surely and firmly rooted forever in humility. It does, however, happen sometimes that the Holy Spirit finds easier ways than those of which we have spoken, whereby he brings such souls to himself. The third degree in which the grain of wheat dies belongs only to the perfect, who with unflagging diligence and ceaseless desire are ever striving to approach perfection. These men state is one of mingled joy and sorrow, whereby they are tossed up and down, for the Holy Spirit is trying and sifting them, and preparing them for perfection, with two kinds of grief and two kinds of joy and happiness, which they have ever in their sight. The first grief is an inward pain, and an overwhelming sorrow of heart, in the sense of the unspeakable wrong done to the Holy Trinity by all creatures, and especially by the bad Christians, who are living in mortal sin. The second grief consists in their fellow feelings for, and experience of all grief and pain, which the human nature of Christ has undergone. The first of these two joys lies in this dying, it is clear intuition and perfect fruition to which they are raised in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit that they may enjoy fruition of Him and triumph in all joys which they hope and believe after this life to behold all in their perfect fullness. The second triumph is that they are fulfilled in all the joys which the human nature of Christ possessed this joy such a such a man hopes to share as the member of Christ, and, even if he cannot fathom the abyss of God, he rejoices therein, for he sees that the overflowing of God's mercy are unspeakable, and feels that it is good for him that he is vanquished in an effort to comprehend God's power and to and bends down beneath God in his self-dying. To this state a man cannot attain, except he unite his will with God, in an entire renunciation and perfect denial of himself, and all selfish love of himself, and all delight in having his own will be overmastered and quenched by his shedding abroad in his heart of the Holy Spirit and the love of God, so that it seems as if the Holy Spirit were the man's will in love, and he were nothing, and willed nothing on his own account. Yeah, even the kingdom of heaven he shall desire for God's sake, and God's glory, because Christ hath earned it in order to supply his needs, and chooseth to bestow it on him as one of his sons. When, in this stage, a man loveth all things in their right order, God above all things, next the blessed human nature of Christ, and after that the blessed mother of Christ, and the saints of all degrees, each according to the rank in which God has enabled him to attain. When his affection are thus regulated, he sets himself in the lowest place at the wedding feast of the bridegroom. And when the bridegroom comes, who has bidden him to the feast, 
he saith unto them, Friend, go up higher. Then is it is endowed with a new life, and illuminated with a new light, in which he clearly perceives and sees that he alone is the cause of his own evil, that he cannot with truth throw the blame either on nature, the world, or the devil. Yea, he also confesses that God has appointed him all these exercises and assaults out of his great love, in order that he may glorify God in overcoming these, and deserve a higher crown. Further, he perceives and sees that it is God alone who has upheld him and stayed his steps, so that he is no longer he has no longer an inclination to sin, and who has removed the occasion to sin, that he might not fall. Yea, what is still worse, he is forced to confess that he has often been dissatisfied that he was not able to derive more enjoyment from his sins. Thus all his being is swallowed up in sorrow and remorse for that he is still laden with this boundless infirmity. But he hath delight and joy in that he seeth that the goodness of God is as great as his necessities, so that his life may, be, may well be called a dying life, by reason of such his griefs and joys which are conformable, and the like unto the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, which from beginning to end is always made up of mingled joy and grief. Grief, in that he left his heavenly throne and came down into the world. Joy, in that he was not severed, severed from the glory and honor of the Father. Grief, in that he was a son of man joy in that he nevertheless was and remained the Son of God. Grief, because he took upon himself the office of a servant. Joy in that he was nevertheless a great Lord. Grief, because in human nature he was mortal and died upon the cross. Joy, because he was immortal according to his Godhead. Grief, in his birth, in that he was once born of his mother. Joy, in that he is the only begotten Son of God's heart, from everlasting to everlasting. Grief, because he became in time subject to time. Joy, because he was eternal before all time, and shall be so forever. Grief, in that the world word was born into the flesh, and hath dwelt in us. Joy, that in the word was in the beginning with God, and God himself was the word. Grief, in that it behooved him to be baptized like any human sinner by St. John the Baptist in the Jordan. Joy, in that the voice of his heavenly Father said of him, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Grief, in that, like others, sinners, he was tempted of the enemy. Joy, in that the angels came and ministered unto him. Grief, in that he oftentimes endured hunger and thirst. Joy, because he himself, the Lord of men of angels, Grief, in that he was often wearied with his labors. Joy, because he is the rest of all loving hearts and blessed spirits. Grief, for as much as his holy life and suffering should remain in vain for so many human beings. Joy, because he should thereby save his friends. Grief, in that he must needs ask to drink water of the heathen woman at the well. 
joy in that he gave to that same woman to drink of living water, so that she could never thirst again. Grief, in that he was wont to sail in ships over the sea. Joy, because he was wont to walk dry-shod over the waves. Grief, in that he wept with Martha and Mary over Lazarus. Joy, in that he raised his brother Lazarus from the dead. Grief, in that he was nailed to the cross with nails. Joy, in that he promised paradise to the thief by his side. Grief, in that he thirsted when hanging on the cross. Joy, in that he should thereby redeem his elect from eternal thirst. Grief, when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Joy, in that he would with these words comfort all sad hearts. Grief, in that his soul was parted from his body, and he died and was buried. Joy, because on the third day he rose again from the dead with a glorified body. Thus was all his life, from the manger to the cross, a mingled web of grief and joy, which life he hath left as a sacred testament to his followers in this present time, who are converted unto his dying life, that they may remember him when they drink of his cup, and walk as he hath walked. May God do so. Amen. Sermon 5 how men must receive all that God gives, and ordains for those who truly seek him in all things, as from his hand, and as for the best. How willingly God gives great gifts, when, in lowliness of mind, we esteem ourselves of small repute, and how all things are as nothing without God. This is that disciple whom Jesus loved. Dear children, Though God is no respecter of persons, and loves all the things he has made, he still has his friends, those who are most conscious of his favor and turn to him with all their might, who are especially dear to him, and it is not his fault that all men do not turn to him, of their own free will. He is always ready to receive us, and he lets the sun of his grace shine on the good and on the evil. Now St. John especially was conscious of the grace of God from his youth, and was always the dearly loved disciple of our Lord, on account of his virginal purity, his perfect love, his keen vision, and all his other virtues. If, therefore, he would be the dear disciple of Jesus, we must first follow St. John by dying wholly to ourselves, by resigning ourselves and all our affections to God, and by receiving all things from his hand, we must deny ourselves all pleasure in the love of created things apart from God. Those men who thus resign themselves, and must submit entirely to God, seek earnestly all that God gives them. For it is, and it seems to them, the best. Thou mayest, as truly as God lives, be certain that it must of necessity be the very best, and that no other way could be better than this, though another might appear so. Yet it would not be so good for thee, for God has chosen this and no other way. Therefore it must needs be the best. It may be sickness, poverty, hunger, or thirst, 
whatever it may be that God ordains or does not ordain, it is still the best for thee. It may be devotion or fervor, or that thou art to possess nothing, as long as it is not caused by thine own neglect. Only make up thy mind to seek God's honor in all things, in all thou hast and hast not, then all that sendeth thee will be for the best. Now thou mightest say, perhaps, How do I know whether it is the will of God or not? Know this, that if it were not the will of God, it could not happen. Thou hast neither days of sickness, nor anything else, except it be the will of God. Now if thou knowest this is God's will, thou oughtest to have so much pleasure and delight therein, that thou wouldst not heed pain as pain, even though it were extreme. It could be wrong for thee to be sensible of pain or suffering. For thou oughtest to accept it from God as the very best for thee. It is his very life to desire only the best. Therefore I ought to desire it, and nothing ought to please me better. Now if there were a man whom I was most desirous to please, and I knew for certain that I should please him better in a grey garb than in any other, however good it might be, that great garb would seem to be more desirable than any other, though it were ever so good. Oh, take heed to yourselves. See how your love is fashioned? If ye truly loved God, nothing would delight you more than doing which pleased him best, desiring that his will should be fully accomplished in us. However severe pain and discomfort may seem, if thou hast not great delight in them as in comfort and pleasure, all is not well with thee. There is one thing which I am wont to say constantly, and which is also true, that we cry out every day and say in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, thy will be done. But then we feel angry, and are not so content with his will as all that he does should seem for the best. They who do accept it as the best are kept in perfect peace in all things. Now sometimes ye say, Oh, if it had been only otherwise, it would have been better, or if it had not happened thus it might have happened better. As long as thou art of this mind, thou wilt never attain peace. Thou must accept all as the very best. Now, Mark, God is the giver of all gifts, and all things that are best and highest are his real and most peculiar gifts. God gives nothing so willingly as great gifts, for it is natural for him to give great things. Therefore, the better things are, the more of them there are. The noblest creatures, the angels, are especially wise. They have no bodily nature, and they and there are more of them in number than any, than any all other created beings. Great things are really great gifts and they are what I can best make my own and most desire. I speak also of that which may actually be expressed in the world, and of which must come out from within quite freely. It must not come from without into the heart, but that must come out from within, which really dwells in the inmost heart. There are th there are things are present unto thee, and live and move and have their being in him, who is the holy and sovereign God. Why dost thou 
not find it thus, because thou are not at home here. A nobler a thing is, the commoner it is. I have my natural sense in common with animals, and life in common with trees, and my being, which is still more to me, in common with all creatures. Heaven is more than all that is thereby, therefore it is also nobler. The nobler things are, the commoner they are. Love is noble because it is universal. It seems hard to do that which our Lord has commanded, and, our, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. But common people say, We ought to love them as we love God, for we love ourselves too well. But no, it should be otherwise. We should therefore love them very much, just as we love ourselves, and this is not hard. For, if ye would only see it, this command is more of a reward than a command. A command seems hard, but a re reward is desirable. He who loves God as he ought to love him, yea, and as he must love him, whether he will or no, and all creatures love him, must love his neighbor as himself. He must joy in his joys, as though they were his own. He must be as desirous for his honor as though it were his own. He must treat a stranger as though he were dear unto him. Then that man will always be rejoicing, always useful, and always honorable. It will seem like heaven to him, and he will have far more joy than if he rejoiced only in his own good. Now know of a truth, that if thine own honor is of more importance to thee, and dearer than that of another man, thou doest wrongfully. Know this, that if thou seekest something that is thine own, thou seekest not God only, and thou wilt never find him. Thou art acting as though thou madest a candle of God to seek for something, and when thou hast found it, thou castest the candle away. Therefore, when thou does, does this, that which thou seekest with God, whatever it may be, it is nothing. Gain, reward, fervor, or whatever it may be, thou seekest nothing. Therefore wilt thou find nothing. There is no other cause for finding nothing, but that thou seekest nothing. All creatures are absolutely nothing. That which has no being is nothing. And creatures have no being, because they have their own being in God. If God turned away for a moment, they would cease to exist. He who desired to have all the world with God would have nothing more than if he had God alone. All creatures have, without him, nothing more than a man has, who has a might, or absolutely nothing, without him, neither more nor less. Listen, I beseech thee, to a true saying. A man might give a thousand marks to build churches and monasteries, and it would be a great gift, but he who careth not for a thousand marks has done more and given more. When God created all creatures, they were so vile and mean that he could not live and move with them. Then he made the soul of man, like unto and in harmony with himself, and that unto him he might give himself. For all else that he gave him, man heeded not, God must give himself to me as his own, 
as he is in himself, or I have nothing and care for nothing. He who would receive God in full measure must give himself wholly to God. He must go out of himself. He will receive the like from God. All that he has as his own, as God himself has it, and has he has given it to Our Lady, and to all that are in heaven. Those who have thus gone forth, and have given themselves, shall also, all alike, receive all in all, and nothing less. Now know that of ourselves we have nothing, for this and all other gifts are from above. Therefore he who would receive from above must of necessity place himself beneath in true humility, and know of a truth that if he leaves anything out so that all is not beneath, he will have nothing and receive nothing. Dost thou trust to thyself, or to anything else, or anybody else? Thou art not beneath, and wilt receive nothing. But if thou hast placed thyself beneath, then thou wilt receive all things fully. It is God's nature to give, and he lives and moves that he may give unto us when we are humble. If we are not lowly, and yet desire to receive, we do him violence, and kill him, so to speak. And, though we may not wish to do this, we yet we do it, as far as in us lies. That thou mayest truly give him all things, see to it, that thou castest thyself in deep humility at the feet of God, and beneath all created beings, that thou exaltest God in thy heart, and that thou confesseth him. The Lord our God sent his only begotten Son into the world. God sent his Son in the fullness of time, for the sake of our souls, and that we might be filled with him. When a soul is freed from time and place, the Father sends his Son into that soul to be born there. Nothing can hinder God in us, or us in God, if in our hearts we neither hang on to nor cleave to time and place, nor exalt ourselves above time and place in eternity, which is God himself. Amen.